Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Um, in this video, I'm going to be doing something a little different. I don't know if anybody's going to be interested in this sort of thing or what, but I'm starting a new campaign for my Shadow Dark group, and I wanted to go through some of my prep. If we've done a session zero, and uh, I don't know. I know that, you know, <laughs> the, the, like the Strahd series, I don't think I'm going to do anything like that, where I go through every session and recap and all that stuff. I mean, unless people really want it, <laughs> but I don't, I don't see myself doing that. But I thought, help, you know, maybe going through what I'm doing here and uh, talking about sort of the house rules that I'll be doing for the new game and all of that, while I maybe make my map a little bit. Um, because uh, I'll be doing some world building and some map building. I don't have an amazing map like I had for the Shadow Dark uh, Curse of Strahd game where I had that you know, beautiful map of Barovia. Um, I'm going to have to make my own, and I kind of already have a little bit. But, uh, yeah, so anyway, I don't know if this will be interesting to anybody. First thing I want to go through is the uh, Session Zero stuff that we did. So I'll be talking about how I've changed Shadow Dark for this new campaign and, and just this little document here, which it's certainly not as developed as my... Um, my document for Curse of Strahd, by any means. Um, but I thought, I don't know, just kind of interesting to go through for my own purposes to kind of have a record of what I did in my prep, not just written down, but what I said. That way I can go back and watch it later and kind of think about where I was coming from and stuff like that. Anyway, I, I thought it was interesting to me to go back through and do that. So maybe you guys will find it interesting too. Anyway, um, so the new campaign is... I think pretty interesting in terms of the setting and in terms of the world that I've been developing. So we have this this Kingdom of Rodir, which, well, so the inspiration of this is the um, the Iberian Wars, basically, the Reconquista between the Christian kingdoms of Spain in the 700s, 800s, 900s, and the, uh, the conquest by the Caliphate, um, and then the, the subsequent Sort of rebellion of Iberia uh, of of the um, Al Andalus from uh, as an emirate and, and the declaration of it as a caliphate itself and just the, you know that whole period of history 711 to 1492 in Spain or in the Spanish Peninsula in Iberia and uh, that's sort of the inspiration that was behind this world or at least this particular part of the world I wanted to do a campaign that was set in sort of a a place that had seen a successive a series of conquests and that some of them were religiously motivated. Not all of them, but some of them were. And I have sort of a Roman Empire analog, although I've changed it a bit. <laughs> and I have a sort of Visigoth analog, but I've changed them significantly. And then I have this, this new uh, conquer conquerors, the, the new conquerors who are uh, sort of like um, the historical conquerors of Spain. But again, it's, it's a very much um, an analog. I, I like historical analogs, but I don't like, you know, one-to-one -one correspondency. So I've been changing things. Pretty significantly. Anyway, what we have here is the focus on the world will be this section right here, uh, this sort of northwestern corner of the peninsula. I'm going to actually switch to this. Here is the peninsula, and you can see, obviously, um, you know, <laughs> heavily influenced by Spain, although it's not actually Spain in terms of its shape. Um, just a, a, a kind of a rundown of this. This is the world layer, so the, each of these hexes is about 24 miles. So we have a, a, a sizable chunk of, of kingdom here. Um, these are prominent cities that I've marked on the map here with the black dots. And then the dots with circles, I think, are either capital cities or just important places that I want to highlight, um, places that I want to maybe detail um, in this world creation process. Uh, and then I have, I have, if you guys know Worldographer, you can zoom in and do the kingdom level. And I've done a little bit of that um, clearing out of this area over here. And then you can go all the way down to the, sorry, the kingdom level if you want to go all the way down. Um, and then, of course, there's the province level. Uh, if you want to go all the way down, right? Uh, but I haven't even worked on those yet. I'm just back on the world level here. So the idea here is that um, the world was initially this portion of the world, this, this um, what would you call this, this peninsula, this subcontinent, <laughs> peninsula really, was initially inhabited by elves ages ago. And I'm thinking sort of Celtic Iberian elves as sort of the influence, right? Celto Iberians, um, those, those initial inhabitants before Rome, before Carthage came, to Spain, you have those um, native peoples, mostly that have the Celtic origin. Um, and so I have that sort of like the, the elves in the background. Now they're they're very far back, you know, we're talking thousands of years. And by this point, there are maybe a handful left. And I'm thinking they're very individualistic. In this world, elves live forever. They don't die, they're immortal. I mean, they, they can be killed. 
but they're el- they're Tolkien elves in that way. And so I wanted them to be very, very different. I, they don't have cities. They don't have um, even lands. If there are elves, they are, they are individuals, and they do things throughout the world, but there's like maybe, you know, <laughs> five dozen left in this portion of the world, at least. There's just not many of them. Now, I had that as an option for the players. They could play an elf. Um, and I'll talk about how I kind of wanted to do that, because it's going to be a level one campaign, so how do you have an immortal thousand-year-old, thousands-year-old elf who's level one? I actually had kind of some ways of doing that, but no one picked an elf, so we don't have to worry about that. Anyway, so the elves were the initial sort of background here, right? They lived they lived in this part of the world thousands of years ago, and there, there are sort of more druidic, right? You have like ruins, standing stones. Uh, if you guys have ever seen Pan's Labyrinth, I'm thinking, you know, when the little girl finds that ruin and she goes down and meets the satyr. Um, that's sort of the, the, the style that I'm thinking of for the elves. It's that that kind of um, vibe, right? <laughs> very, very early um, European, Western European. Um, and then, uh, as time went on, the uh, conquerors came. And the conquerors are the sort of the Comos. They're the dwarves. And they're the Roman Empire equivalent, but I'm not making them Roman in terms of their... Well, they're Roman in terms of a lot of their <laughs> a lot of their um, vibe and a lot of their purpose in the world, what they do, the function, the, the old empire that unified everything. That's Roman. But the style that I'm going for is Byzantine. So you have these Byzantine dwarves, you know, Eastern Roman Empire. Um, and they're... So there's Greek influence as opposed to just Latin. So the language is much more Greek. The, uh, the styles are much more Greek. The words I'm using are Greek in terms of my influence. Obviously, I'm, I'm adapting, but that's where I'm starting from, sort of a Byzantine, Greek, Eastern Roman Empire idea. And the dwarves settled over this whole area. Now, it wasn't just elves. I should make that clear that there were elves and then human tribesmen came in. And the, the elves sort of maybe led or taught or dominated in some ways through mystical or through magical or through religious means, the human tribes. And so the humans vastly outnumbered the elves before the dwarves came, the human tribes, but they were subservient in a way. And they had their own like religion based around the elvish elders and things like that. And then when the dwarves came in, that was sort of a climactic change. Most of the elves had probably disappeared by then or had gone away, dead, or just traveled away, gone. So there were still some, but they were very less numerous. And then the dwarves came in and did away with a lot of them, killed a lot of them, and established themselves here. And so the roads here, the bridges, the dams, the aqueducts, right, that's all dwarven. And it put the infrastructure across the whole world. I'm not necessarily saying that dwarves de- dig down deep. In fact, I think that maybe there are some dwarves that dig down deep. But for the most part, I think what we're looking at is surface dwarves. And maybe their, their tradition is that they came from the earth, right? Their tradition is that they, they, they first started far, far, far to the east. They originally d- dug up into the surface world. But, you know, n- n- not having dark vision um, in Shadow Dark, dwarves have no more reason to live underground than humans do. They have an affinity, obviously, but I'm always struck by the line in Gimli's song, right, um, about how bright Moria used to be in The Lord of the Rings, right? He talks about how it was shining. Um, there were lamps that, that played all day and all night, right? The light of sun and moon and stars, right? He says, uh, what is, how does the song? The light of sun and stars and moon in shining lamps of crystal hewn, undimmed by cloud or shade of night, they shone forever fair and bright. It's a great poem. And, uh, and it's this idea that the, the Moria used to be bright, used to be full of light and, and, and fire and, and these, you know, dwarves don't like darkness is my, my vibe. And so it's not like they don't like, wouldn't live under the earth unless they had to. So this idea that they came to the surface and, you know, spread and took over. So the dwarves were the Roman equivalent. And then um, their empire fell mostly through internal division, mostly through corruption, mostly through things falling apart. Um, and so that empire split and broke, and so this was sort of a, you know, a, an isolated, not isolated, but it was, a, it was a, a province of that, and so there were still lots of dwarves and lots of dwarven influence here, and they were in charge. And then from somewhere north, um, these tribes came who were uh, dragon riders, dragons, and the dragon, I want, you know, I wanted to bring some dragons in this campaign because it's been a while since I've done dragons as an influence in my Dungeons and Dragons games. Well, in Shadow Dark, but you get the point. Um, it's been a while since I've done that, and so I wanted a, a solid dragon element to this world. And so these dragons, uh, these guys invaded, basically the Visigoths, right? They were um, uh, barbarians in a lot of ways, but they were very powerful because they had these dragons, and they worshipped them, and their whole culture was built around them. And so 
they came in and just erased many of the big dwarven cities because of the dragon fire and all these things, and they just uh, you know, dominated, completely conquered and overthrew. But there were, there were relatively few of them, right? So it was sort of an elite military class ruling on top. And below that, you had this mix of this sort of old tribal elements of the humans, which had been developed and had you know, kind of been blended in to the dwarven clan system and order. They were like clanless, but they had their own structures. The dwarves set them up that way, right? So they were basically like the, the, the new clans of the humans and mixed things like that. And so that was all there underneath this substrata of, as a substrata, I should say, beneath the, the military rulers, these dragon riders. And then as centuries went on, they lost dragons. Basically, there was just a handful left. Um, and they kind of blended with the people below them and it kind of created a new culture and just sort of like, you know, the reason I'm doing all this, by the way, is so that I can have distinct eras of ruins, magic items. That's really why I'm doing this history, right? I like, and, and, and weapons and stuff. Like I want players to be able to find a dragon scale shirt. I know where it comes from, right? Oh, this is from these people. Or, you know, if they find uh, an old Comos you know, great sword. They're like, okay, this is from the Dwarven period. And like, I just want to be able to, to flavor it and to structure it that way. So that's why I'm doing this sort of background in my own world. But also it helps me, you know, helps me know a lot of the stuff that's going forward. And then finally, just a few decades ago, basically, um, the Daraj, which are the people from the South, um, they conquered. They came and the, the grandfather of the current Khalifa, uh, he slew the last dragon, who was kind of old and fat and not really very dangerous, right? <laughs> but the rest of them had either died or, or gone and you know, disappeared. And so once that was destroyed, the military rulers, right, who had kind of ruled for on the backs of their dragons, literally and, perverb, and, and you know, metaphorically, they, they ruled from uh, this position of power because they had these dragons. Well, now that they were gone, there were only a handful of them anyway, I mean, relatively, you know, and, and they were just pretty much wiped out. And so now you have... Uh, a few decades ago, the conquest of the Diraj. And the Diraj are religious in their motivation. I have them have the, the their, their gods, or the, the, there's the three two-faced gods, essentially. So they have three gods, which each have two faces, and so they're sort of like this, the three and six, they call them. And uh, I, I kind of think it's kind of cool. Um, their priests wear like double-sided masks, and they change them, and you yeah, have these creepy things. Anyway, I think it looks, it sounds pretty cool. And uh, I think you have a lot of cool evocative imagery there. Anyway, they conquered, and they basically conquered very quickly the base southern half of this, up to about this river here, is my thought. And then, north of it, there's a bunch of territories. And they did fight battles for them, and they mostly won, in particular Rodir, which is where the players are going to begin this sort of, you know, coastal, uh, coastal kingdom here. They fought some battles and won, but they, it was pretty far away from their homeland, and so they just established basically like a, you know, a... a dictatorship here like they just uh, elevated one of the you know sides of the royal family here and said hey you're now in charge but you owe fealty to us you're an emir rather than a king um which you know is a governor sort of sort of <laughs> you're a governor basically and uh, you pay us fealty you can stay in control keep the peace here and you know keep the markets open to us because they're a major mercantile uh, the dirage are major merchants that's one of the things that motivates their their trade is opening up new markets to their merchants and so um and so this, this kingdom is not occupied exactly by the Diraj, but it's, it's, the king has been killed, the royal family has been replaced by a pretender or by a, by a, a second family who owes fealty to the Diraj. That's the sort of political background uh, the players are going to start in that. And, and as a result of that, there's been sort of a breakdown of the regular order of society because the noble families have mostly either sided with the old king and then were defeated or replaced, or they kind of remain neutral and tried not to get involved. No one really respects the, the new governor and the, the emir, and the countryside's pretty lawless. And so I have the, it's, it seems like the perfect place for a campaign to be run, right? You have a power structure, but it's corrupt and or ineffectual, at least outside of its small domain. So if you go to the cities, if you go to the, the areas around the, you know, the Lord's Keeps, then there's some power and then you'll be dealing with him and his men, his agents. But mostly, you know, the wilderness is pretty wild. The villages have to look for, to themselves perfect grounds for, for adventurers to be acting, you know? <laughs> and uh, and so I think it's a great setting. So that's what the world sort of, the, the, the world that I'm playing in, in a nutshell is. And I know it's it's not you know, crazy original or anything like that. It's just basically taking history and applying filters to it, right? That's what I'm doing here. But I think that's actually a really good thing to do. I always enjoy doing that for my games, is sort of applying filters to history. But I also like to add elements of weirdness 
And, and so I think that's one of the things that I'm going to be doing moving forward is adding elements of weirdness to this campaign. Okay, so now that you get a sense of the world, um, talking about what we did in Session Zero. So um, I did what I did for the Curse of Strahd campaign, and I gave them roles. Now I have um, the Helivasi, the Komos, and the Neri, who are the elves, dwarves, and halflings. Nobody picked one, so those aren't important backgrounds. But for the humans, I had seven possible roles that they could pick. And again, these are... If you've seen my Curse of Strahd video, you'll know what roles are. They're not backgrounds, they're not classes, and they're not like, hmm, how to put it, they're not like personalities. Really what they are is um, archetypes, right? Like genre archetypes, things that we see in fantasy or in sword and sorcery or in, you know, science fiction or whatever. I like to add those into games and let players pick one. Now, I also as an, I'll always say as an option, you can just pick none of them. You can say, nope, I want, I want my own thing. So these are suggestions and these are options. If players think that's interesting and they want to tie themselves into the world in a particular way, then they can look through these and pick one. Otherwise, they can just say, nope, I want my own thing. So I always add that as an option, but nobody usually picks that. Usually they pick one of these things that tie them into the world in a particular way. So for example, the black sheep, right? Your family holds a prominent position in society in the new order since the conquest. For one reason or another, you find yourself as an outcast and a disappointment. So that's a pretty common trope we see in fantasy, right? There's like the, the, you know, the thief that you run into turns out to be, you know, the exiled scion of some noble house, right? Or the the guy who just seems like he's a normal soldier, when push comes to shove, says, "All right, okay, we can go. I know somebody, right?" And then he takes you to his father, who actually owns a lot of land. Like so, that's a sort of a, a, an archetype that we see, a trope that we see, and I wanted to you know, add it as an option. You can be that guy. I have the attendant, right? As you remember the glory days of the King of Rodir with pride, having had a place at court. This loyalty has cost you dearly. So this is somebody who remembers the old days, right? This is the old advisor or the general or the, you know, the palace guard or the surgeon, right? The king surgeon or whatever it was. The King of Rodir died in battle. The royal family was scattered or killed. And as a result, the, the pretender's been in place. So if you're an attendant, right, you, you're like, oh, I remember. I was there 2,000 years ago, right? I mean, not quite 2,000 years ago, but it's, it's actually only like 15 years ago. But still... I think that's a cool trope and a cool archetype to play, so that's why I included it. Then I have the apprentice, who was the one who taught your art was unequaled in the field. Um, a fact you only learned after his death. Despite his mastery, he chose to live in secrecy and hiding. Uh, I should say it was known to be unequaled in the field. So basically, the, you know, this is the uh, this is the Yoda thing, right? You're trained by this guy who's, who's really good at it, but then you find out after he's dead that he was actually once you know, famous throughout the world and has retreated here for some unknown reason. Everyone thought he was dead or something like that, right? That's one of them is the apprentice. And there's the conqueror, which is you are one of the Diraj, uh, the conquerors of Arkelos. Whether you are proud of the fact or not, the common folk will naturally fear and distrust you. So you're one of the, the people from the South. Maybe you're an agent of the Diraj. Maybe you like the fact that they conquer. Maybe you're fully supportive of it. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're an exile. Maybe you're an outcast. Maybe you actually don't care. Maybe you're just like, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not in my homeland anymore. I don't care. I don't want to be part of it. But it connects you to the world. And that's the thing I, I wanted to do with each of these is that they connect you to the world, not necessarily in like a have a quest because of this role, right? Not like you start with a side quest, right? But rather you start with a connection to the world and, and the people in it such that you will have an aid to role play. That was how kind of what I wanted to do here. The next one I did is the Outlander. And this is similar to the Conqueror in that you're not from this region. You hail from one of the many realms of the north and east that lie beyond the mountains. So the particular must have brought you to this corner of the world. And again, this isn't going to be a quest. I mean, it could be. You could develop that on your own and be like, hey, I really want this. This is why I'm here. But the idea behind the Outlander was to be like, look, when you enter a town, you're going to look different. You're not going to look like the Dirage, right? You're not going to have that particular style of dress or that particular, you know, shade of skin or whatever, such that the, 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 the people are going to look at you with fear because you're one of the Conquerors. But you are going to look different, and so people are going to be like, hey, who are you, right? And, and then your interaction with the factions in the world, I am an outsider. I don't know what's going on here. I have no relation. That's something you could play. So if you wanted to play that sort of fish out of water without being one of the conquerors and feared, right, um, you could do that with the outlander background. Then again, it makes sense if you're like, hey, I want to play a Viking, right? <laughs> I want to play somebody like that. Well, then you'd pick the outlander role because probably that's not somebody who would have been here. But you're like, hey, I have this character concept in mind that's very different from the world you've developed. Awesome. Well, pick the outlander then. Um, then I had the branded, which is an outlaw or runaway slave. Your brand shows you to be a member of the Diraj, an enemy, excuse me, of the Diraj and those in power here, whether you intend to be or not. Right? So you are an outlaw, a runaway slave, a, a, a thief, a, a murderer, whatever it is, and you've been branded. And then I left, you know, it's not you've been branded on the face or the, you know, the hand or something like that. Yeah, it's up to you. 
I like the branded because, well, as I said, I, I just I think it's interesting to connect it to the world in a particular way, and this is going to be a very particular connection. Um, and then finally, I did the dispossessed, right? Your father was a noble in the old kingdom of Radir. Your family had lands, adherents, and even soldiers. That's all gone, though perhaps you have a memory of it. So the idea is you are one of the old nobility that sided with the old king and lost. So that's all gone. You don't have those lands anymore. But it's different than the black sheep, right? The black sheep is your part of your family's part of the new position. They, they, they got along. Maybe they're collaborators. Maybe they're just, you know, in the background going along with it. Maybe they're just not important enough to have been replaced or something like that. But the dispossessed were. They were loyal. They were um, followers and they're gone. So again, these are going to be different relationships with the different factions in the world. And I think that's interesting. It's not necessarily a, this is not a prescription for how you have to roleplay your character. It's not a quest, right? These are ways for you to interact with the world. So it's slightly different in that sense. It's slightly different than what I did for the Curse of Strahd with the roles there, where some of them tied directly to particular characters in the world. This was a way for us to approach session zero with a bit more confidence, a bit more utility, some tools that we have. Now, I also did some for the Halavasi. I did the Warden, the Wanderer, and the Nemesis. I had the Komos, which is the Dwarves of the Reclaimer, a Son of Silver and Steel, and the Eidolon. Or the Eidolon. I think it's Eidolon. But anyway. And then there's the Neri, uh, which was the Outcast, the City Born, and the Curious. Now, as it turns out, everybody just played humans. All four characters. I think that has to do, first of all, with some of the roles, but also with the ideas the characters were developing before Session Zero about their characters, with what we did in the world building, and what I what I explained to them about you know the situations and stuff. And also, just the Shadow Dark ancestries. I think... A lot of players, my players, really like having that extra talent role. Um, yeah, so I think they just wanted to play humans. But I like that. I like human-centric games. I, I mean, I, you know, I definitely like the other ancestries. I like the other races, fantasy races. It's cool to have dwarves and elves and halflings in there. But I, I'm just, I'm always human-focused. And so, you know, it, ultimately we are looking at humans, <laughs> right? Regardless of what you play, you're, you're really playing different aspects of humanity. Um, you know, different archetypes and different... Uh, attributes magnified, right? I mean, that's really what you're looking at when you're playing any game and you're doing different races and things like that. So uh, that's what I that's what I like about uh, the humans here. And I'm glad they all picked it. So um, one of my players picked the Black Sheep. One of my players picked the Apprentice. One of my players picked the Attendant and another player picked the Branded. So those are the four. Black Sheep, Attendant, Apprentice, and Branded. And I really liked that. So what we did was we actually kind of wove together uh, a coherent party. And we started really figuring out the apprentice. So my my the uh, the player who played the apprentice wanted to play a Raz Godai from um, Red Sands, which is the second of the Cursed Scrolls, and it makes sense with the Diraj. So he's playing a Diraj um, Raz Godai, and I don't know we're calling it in the world yet, except just Raz Godai for now. Uh, and the idea is that there, that there is this um, that there's this. Uh, you know, a group of assassins that the Diraj make use of. And they're sort of like one of the many different cultures that belong to the Diraj, which is sort of more like a, a covenant. It's more of like, you know, like you think of Halo, right? The covenant, you have these different um, races that go along with um, the one religion. Sort of like that. The Diraj are a little bit like a, it's a collection. And so one of them are these people that have the Razgadai. And so he's one of, he's an apprentice of one of the great Razgadai. That's what we decided. But for some reason, that his master had come to this portion of the world in hiding with him and was kind of doing his own thing. And he was going through and figuring out what to, you know, what to do, uh, like, you know, having all these missions that the, the character didn't really understand and telling him to go here and assassinate this guy and get, you know, break into this place and take these notes. And it was seemed very, very disconnected. Um, so that was one connection. We had the apprentice and his master. And then his master died. And now he doesn't know exactly what his master was doing here, but he knows that it was some connection to a lot of disparate things. You know, the orcs and goblins coming out of the mountains in the northeast, the slavers attacking the coastlands, uh, corruption in the city here, um, you know, X, Y, and Z. Different things all around the nation that seem to be disconnected. But his master was working on them all, and so he's seen, he thinks that they're connected. Now, once we had that character and his master, we started to connect the others, because the character who played the branded was, he play, he's playing a wizard, or a mage, and he is also, he says he wanted to also be a Diraj, and so I thought, it made perfect sense. I have the idea of the, the Diraj have the seven sorcerers. The Khalifa has seven sorcerers who are her, um, you know, her backbone, her, her protection, her, her, her magical assistance. And they assisted in the conquest, and they've been around for generations. They're the viziers, basically, right? And they each have their own apprentices and their own things. And so he's one of those. He's one of the apprentices of the seven sorcerers. 
And so he's escaped. He's been branded. He broke the law. He got away somehow. And he went to find this guy. He, some friend of his in the palace said, hey, I know where X is. He's still alive. Go find him. He'll protect you and, and he'll help you. And so he went to find him and he arrived and this guy's dead. And so now he's here with the other Diraj. They're both here. They don't know what to do because the master's dead and um, people are after them. Perhaps people are after the branded. People are... You know, what was the master looking into? Now he's not here. He can't protect us anymore. So it's an interesting kind of dynamic, right? The two of them are not friends, but they both, uh, they're both on the run. They're both outsiders um, in one sense. Um, but they don't, not for the same reasons and not to the same degree. I think that's really cool. Um, then the third character, the one who picked the attendant, she she's playing a sort of healer. That's her idea is that she's been sort of like a heal anyone regardless of background and circumstances. So her father was the court physician in the old court of the king. She was a little girl. She was raised there when the king died, when the bar, when the kingdom fell, her mother fled, her father died. And so now she, but she learned a little bit from him and she vowed to kind of take up his, his role. And one of the things he was, was, you know, heal anyone, heal anyone. And so she, that's sort of her thing. And so it makes sense that during this time, this is how we kind of connected the backgrounds, right? During the time of the Raz Gadai's character and his master, operating here there were times when they were badly injured and they went to her and so even though they're you know outlaws they're assassins they're kind of under the radar trying to do these things probably for the greater good we don't know yet exactly maybe they're good maybe their master wasn't who knows you know leaving that aside um she was going to help them and over time developed a friendship with them they came to her over and over you know she became kind of like their go-to um, healer and she would help them regardless of again she helps anyone and now, and she developed a friendship with the master in particular. She knew him more than she knew the character. And now that he's dead, it affects her. It very much affects her. She's, you know, not just saddened by it, but it's the loss of a close friend and perhaps more than that, perhaps, I don't know. And now she wants to know why he's dead. And, and we figured out a, a, a kind of a, a moving forward from there. And then finally, the last one was the, the, the black sheep. And he says he's playing his character a little bit like a, he's playing a little, um, sociopathic like his, he like he doesn't understand human emotion he doesn't feel it he he wants to be connected to people but he doesn't feel empathy for them so it's more intellectual he's like no i'm going i'm deciding that i'm going to pretend to feel what you're feeling he's an interesting character a really interesting idea um uh, that he's uh he's just decided he's going to kind of be amongst people but he doesn't have his own moral code the way we ended up describing him ultimately was a little bit like the character amos i think from the expanse if you guys have ever seen that right who this guy is willing to kind of do whatever at least at least initially very brutal very hard um has no qualms about killing right or stealing or anything but realizes that he needs a group realizes that he needs kind of a moral compass that he doesn't have and so he just kind of assigns it to uh, not julie mao but the other sister i forget what her name is and just sort of decides, okay, I'm going to be with them, and they're my family, they're my group. I'm going to, I'm going to protect them. I'm going to, you know, subsume my kind of amorality to their group, and accept what they do. And that's kind of a cool character. I like that idea. I like Amos a lot from the Expanse. I think he's a good character. And so it's interesting that that that's the sort of character he developed. I like that a lot. So those are the four characters, and and the way that he connected was during one of these missions, where. Um, the Raz Gadai was going out and doing stuff. He ran into him and they fought. They, you know, they, they protected each other because they were both doing... Because he's a black sheep. He's a criminal. He kind of had criminal contacts and stuff. And so he got in over his head. The Raz Gadai happened to be there. They realized they needed each other. They protected each other and they kind of had their own. They became friends. And so now he's been helping him on his missions and they've been helping each other and sort of connecting. And So it makes a lot of sense. The group has come together in a really cool way, right? These aren't just random strangers who have found each other. These are particular characters who have connections and uh, a backstory and a back history and reasons to keep together in the face of finishing one adventure or finishing two adventures. And I think that's important for a Session Zero card. So anyway, that was our Session Zero. It was pretty much coming up with the characters. They rolled up their stats. We uh, developed, you know, the, the, so there's there's a, a ranger, a, that's the attendant, uh, the healer. Um, she's playing a ranger. There's the fighter um, who's playing the... Um, He's playing the black sheep. He's the the the, the, the um, Amos <laughs> type character. Then we have the Raz Gudai who's playing the apprentice, and we have a, a wizard who's playing the branded. So I think it's a really cool party. There's no priest. There's no direct healer, but the you know the um, the uh, I think the ranger will have some. I mean, they have a couple of their their herbs can be used for healing if you get a high enough on the check, and so we'll see uh, how that works out. They might have to have some. Um, 
more caution than they had in the Strahd because they had a healer. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> they have higher AC and more attack power, this group, certainly. But definitely lower healing. Um, so that was a lot of what we did in Session Zero, was go through the world. Explain. I explained where I was coming from with the setting and the themes and sort of the the vibe, and they came up with their characters and worked them together. Now, the, 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 the tone that we're going for is definitely Sword and Sandal, which might sound strange for a Shadow Dark game, but um, the characters, were, the world we're entering into, I said, is sort of, um, you know, imagine togas are, are, are passing away and robes are kind of coming in as the Dirage style takes over and becomes more the dominant culture of the, of the peninsula. Um, but the toga was the sort of the thing, right? The, the, the wealthy elite would have worn that. And so um, I, I had sort of a went through eras and the only kind of like medieval or early medieval um, culture is those dragon riders. And so they were only for a very brief period, I mean, historically speaking, just a couple hundred years and they were an elite class. So there, there certainly will be chain shirts or scale shirts, right? And great swords and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but those are going to be limited to relics from that era or people who still hold to those ways. Um, there are still a handful of them around. And in fact, unbeknownst to the players, the big bad of this first campaign is going to be a guy who's trying to restore... He's trying to find a dragon egg and uh, restore the the dragon riders um, rally and, uh, and, and drive out the so-called invaders. And, and so that's one of the guys orchestrating all the stuff happening in this kingdom. He's going to start a, a re rebellion here, basically. And he's going to draw on any any dissidents basically that he can in order to drive out the uh, the Diraj. and it's going to be interesting because the Diraj are not i'm not thinking of the khalifa as evil she's not the one who actually instituted the conquest but she's the one now in charge and uh and so they're not evil but they are they're lawful and very you know hard lawful neutral lawful evil in terms of their um well many of them are lawful evil but lawful neutral there's probably some lawful good in there too i'm thinking in terms of you know alignments from old editions. Obviously in, in um, Shadow Dark you just have the three. These are definitely lawful people. So order, structure, rules. Um, that's definitely what they have going for them. <laughs> and uh, you know, they divide people into castes and into orders and into groups. And um, and they, they're okay with things like slavery and they're okay with things like, you know, um, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, military castes and all that. So it's very structured, very, very orderly, um, pretty oppressive but not necessarily where the players are starting. The, the Diraj are not occupying it. This is a sort of collaborator government. So there are certain rules that have been implemented because the Diraj demanded or insist on it, and taxes are paid. But the guy in charge is just a pretender to the throne. He's just, he's the emir is just, you know, was the cousin of the old king or something, or the nephew of the old king. And now he's in charge, and he's like, okay, great. Um, I'm in charge, but no one really likes me. No one listens to me. <laughs> I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. So I, I think it's kind of an interesting political system, political structure the players are going to be entering into. So the other thing that we did in um, in session zero was go through the, the optional rules or the supplemental rules, the additional rules, the, the, the changes I'll be running to Shadow Dark. And they're going to be very similar to the rules that I ran for Curse of Strahd. So um, really, there's kind of four or five that are the pr primary ones. The first is going to be the stress system. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it. Even though it's not horror, um, the idea of, of having a stress system in a game is actually very appealing to me. Um, considering going into a dungeon would be an incredibly stressful situation. Meeting a monster would be an incredibly stressful situation. Watching your friends go down or get hit, you getting hit really badly by a critical hit, you know, by an attack, whatever, would be a very stressful situation. And so the idea that you're going to have stress, you know, fight, flight, or freeze as a potential outcome, um, I think that actually really works. I'm going to keep it. And I think the players were happy to do that too. It might not come into play as much. Um, it's not a horror game, but I think having that stress system was a lot of fun. And it also provided them with that meta currency. Because I said basically whenever something happened, if I didn't ask you to, to take a stress test, you could choose to take a stress uh, or enroll and get a luck point. So it was a bit of like, okay, I'm going to add more stress to my character to get some luck points. And, um, and actually that worked out really well. So we're going to keep that. Um, I'm going to keep the pulp rule where you can have as many luck points as you want. That's going to keep going. That's going to keep um, the game. So it, it adds. It's kind. Of, it's not. You know, the stress plus that kind of provides a nice balance. I think for in the terms of the the uh, the tone. So that's one big thing we're keeping and changing from Shadow Dark as written. The, the other thing is hit points. I'm, I'm sticking with the into the odd system where you have flesh and grit. I think that really is good. Um, it's just. It's yeah. It's it's vastly superior in my mind to just straight up hit points. Um, so we're going to keep that, and uh, and I really like what that does as you go through an adventure, as you go through a campaign where you start to take damage, 
And you really start to have to consider, okay, is a rest sufficient? Do we need to retreat? Do we need to spend a few days back in town? Like all of those things actually start to add up, not immediately, but eventually they become big decision points in the campaign. That was certainly true in Curse of Strahd and it, I, I think it will be true in this campaign too. So I really like that system. Um, so that is, that's the second thing. The third thing I'm gonna be doing that's pretty significantly different from, from Shadow Dark as written um, is the, uh, is the, um, the initiative system. I, I really like simultaneous initiative, or rather rolling a d6 side-based initiative with, if you roll the same number, you get side, you get it as simultaneous. That worked out really well. It made fights super dangerous. It made fights super stressful. It made them very fun, quick decision-making. I think that's really cool. So definitely keeping that, um, that, that quick initiative. And then the other thing that I'm definitely keeping is, oh, well, I'm, I'm ignoring the, 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 the always on time. I get why that's done. I, I, it doesn't click with me. It doesn't click with my table. And I know it's a big part of the Shadow Dark appeal, and a lot of people love that and say it's kind of core Shadow Dark. I don't think that it is. And I just I just don't find it to be very appealing to me. So we don't do an always on timer um, with the lights and the torches and things like that. We just adjust it to, you know, other OSR kind of style. So the light spell lasts an hour in real in the game, right? It doesn't just it's not just an hour in real time, and torches are the same and that sort of thing. Um and then finally, the kind of the, the another change that I really, really, really like and highly recommend you guys do, not just in Shadow Dark, but basically in any game, is we're going to use the underclock. That's something that I talked about in a couple of my videos on the Curse of Strahd. Um, it's something that you can find out about online, the, the underclock, is, but it's a fantastic idea or it's a replacement for random encounters. So much better. I, I might make a whole video on it. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit here, but the, the, the underclock is such a good mechanic. Because one of my problems with random encounters is you get two extremes. The extremes are very frustrating. Um, sometimes you get an average roll, you know, you roll averagely and you get a few random encounters, but not too many. <laughs> but the extremes are frustrating. The extremes are no random encounters or tons of random encounters. And either way is very frustrating to me. Tons of random encounters tends to, in my opinion, get in the way of the dungeon you had planned, the adventure you had planned. Players get very frustrated by the sense of continually getting random encounters with, with just and 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 no escalation to them. Just suddenly six random encounters back to back. You know, you know, exaggerating, but you get the idea. On the other hand, you can have really cool random encounter tables that just happen to never get rolled. Right? You keep on rolling threes and fives, and you just never have a random encounter. And you can obviously say, oh yeah, I rolled a one and, and add a random encounter in, but if you're going to do that, then you might as well just have set encounters. So the the underclock, uh, bit, the way it works, if you guys don't know, is you start with a d20, and the clock starts at 20. And then every time you would roll a random encounter check, instead of just rolling a d6 and seeing if you get a random encounter, you subtract the number rolled from the 20. So if you roll a 1, the number become, the, the, the underclock becomes 19. If you roll a 3, it becomes 17. If you roll a 5, it becomes 15. Now, if you roll a six, it becomes 14, but then you roll again and it explodes. So what that means is you theoretically, and, and the idea is when you get to below zero, when you get to sub zero on the clock, you have a random encounter. So you could theoretically, right, roll four sixes in a row or three sixes and a five, and then you'd have a random encounter. Six, 12, 18, you know, negative three. Okay, random encounter. So you could theoretically have a random encounter on the very first attempt, but that's not usually what's going to happen. What's usually going to happen is that it's going to slowly build, you know, tick down. You're going to start at 16, 18, you're going to go down to, you know, go down to 16, go down to 11, go down to 4, go down to 1, go down to negative 3. Random encounter. That's, you know, something like that's going to happen. Um, that's, that's what usually happens, right? It just ticks down. This has a couple of really great effects. One of them is that the players get a sense of mounting pressure. The longer we wait, the closer that number is getting to zero, and the more likely we are to have that encounter on any roll. That pressure is delicious. It's so much fun, and I, when, especially when the players are hurting, when they're they've got a lot of loot and they don't want to know if they don't know if they want to keep going, whatever. Having that tangible risk that they see getting bigger and bigger and bigger to an inevitability is really cool. It's really cool. Now it's not it's not simply an inevitability because if you hit exactly zero, the number resets to three and you get a sign of the random encounter. That's also true if you just get to three. As soon as you get to three on the dice, you have a sign of the next random encounter. Um, if you if you hit it exactly, if you hit four or two, you don't get the sign. But if you roll the three, then you do. And if you get to exactly zero, then it resets to three and you get that sign. So that's really cool. The players get a sense of we're getting close, we're getting close, and you start to hear it, you start to get a sense of it, you get to three, and then the encounter can happen. 
But you could theoretically get to three, roll a three, it resets to three, roll a two, then roll a one, resets to three. You could continually do that. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna always get a random encounter right when you think you are. Um, it's variable, but it basically changes the statistical likelihood of, of random encounters. The extremes are gone or at least minimized. And on average, if you look at, I think it's Goblin Punch who does this. Um, you can look, maybe it's the clock. I don't remember where it is, but you can you can find the link. Uh, you know, search the underclock die, um, and you'll find that um, the math works out to be basically being on average the same basically as using just a straight up d6. But the difference is the extremes are gone, and it goes from being a on-off switch, either you have a random encounter or not, to having this building sense of dread. And that's so valuable. The idea is, again, it's the difference between surprise and dread, or fear and dread, right? <laughs> if you have fear, it's the thing, the tiger is jumping at you, that's fear, surprise, jump scares. Right, that's a random encounter. Uh-oh, you had a random encounter, you didn't see it coming. Um, but the other is dread, building sense of dread, and that seems much stronger, because also, with that building sense of dread, you still could roll a random encounter. Because, again, if you're at 12, you could roll a 6, well, if you're at 12, that wouldn't, well, if you roll a 6 and a 6, then you, you roll, explodes again, you would roll another one, it would be below zero. But if you're at, say, 13, you roll a six, you roll a six, you roll a three. When you're sub two, you roll a random encounter. So you, you theoretically could, you're at seven, right? You roll a six and then a five, you have a random encounter. So just because you're not in that one to six range doesn't mean you're safe from a random encounter. So you could still have that jump scare moment where you didn't expect a random encounter and now you just got one. But it's less likely to have that jump scare and instead you have this building sense of dread. And that's so valuable, I love that. And the effect it's had on my games is just awesome. Really, really good. I mean, I highly recommend you guys check this out. There are other rules too, like if you rest in the dungeon, the D6 becomes a D8. Um, check out the, the blog post, I think it's really good. Some of it I don't really do, like the stuff where the die resets a certain amount after you spend a certain amount of time outside the dungeon and a certain amount of treasure disappears. Like that stuff you can take or leave, but the basic mechanic of the underclock die is amazing. And uh, I highly recommend it. It's really good. One of the things that I used in the Curse of Trod campaign when I started using the underclock die was I would add in ways of manipulating that that table. So basically, right, if you if you uh, ring the bell, then you immediately subtract the d8 from the underclock die. Or maybe you you know you you silence the guards at the alarm post. Well, maybe you get to add a d8 to the to the underclock die. Right? There are, there are ways of it's a it's a new it's a new dial to turn to dial up the the tension, pull the tension back, let the players interact with the random encounter chances a bit more. I think that's really cool. Really, really cool. Because you could increase the number, right? Instead of the underclock being 20, it's 25. You could decrease the number for this dungeon, it's 15. You could increase the die rolled, eight, 10, 12, so it's way more likely or less likely to get a random encounter. Um, you could say that it always, or it never explodes. If you wanted, you can do, again, there, there are things that you can do to make random encounters more or less likely instead of just saying it's a one in six or a two in six. Some people are totally fine with that. Some people totally don't mind having a just a flat one in six, two in six, three in six chance of rolling a random encounter. That's fine. If you're happy with that, don't worry about it. But I think if you have had struggled with random encounters or finding them very enjoyable or having that frustration at times with the extremes, then try the underclock die. I'm going to be using it throughout the whole campaign. So instead of just the random encounter chances. So basically that's it. I explained those things to them and then we had our session zero. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to make my first dungeon. <laughs> I know that the players are starting off going to a town that's gonna to be attacked by slavers. Um, they're going there because the the Razgadai's teacher told him to, um, told him to go, basically had like a death note, right? <laughs> like, like uh, in case of death, go here. And so he disappeared. You know, if, if you're reading this, I'm dead. Uh, go to this man, he will help you. Uh, and, and that's what they're doing. So they're going to see this guy in an attempt to find out what happened to their old master. And so I'm going to have a, a town that's been attacked by slavers. You know, there'll be a few slavers there probably, and then the slavers will have gone to their stronghold where they're just like, you know, it's a nearby ruined keep where they're basically holding it, holding up until they can gather enough people from the surrounding villages and sail away and make some money. So there will be some slaves there, there will be some slavers there, and there's something going on. I think the place has a monster that the slavers didn't know about, and it broke free, and now there's like, you know, it's sort of like a monster that the players are having to deal with, and the slavers and the slaves, and trying to find the guy in it. And so it'll be, you know, just a, you know, maybe a two or three session dungeon. But a couple factions I have built in, a monster and the slavers and the slaves, and then stuff going on in this old ruin. Uh, out. Maybe I think I'm thinking it was either on an island or like an island, or like a little you know peninsula basically, or like a little spit of land that at low tide is an island, at high tide is a 
uh, there's a causeway to the land, like Saint Michel in uh, Mont Saint Michel in France, you know that sort of thing. So I think that's kind of cool. Uh, and that's how I'm picturing it. So anyway, that will be um, that will be the new campaign, and we're going to start it off pretty soon. So. Uh, I, I, you know, I had all these plans of doing Dolmenwood or of doing um, Gods of the Forbidden North, but I think I'm going to hold off until the Dolmenwood books are totally out to run a Dolmenwood campaign. And Gods of the Forbidden North, same thing. I think I'm going to hold off until all three of those books are out and I can run the whole thing. Because I really want to, but um, that's going to be in the future. So this will be the summer campaign, at least, that we'll be playing. Anyway, again, I didn't do a whole lot of world building. I didn't do a whole lot of map making. Um, maybe in another video, if you guys are interested in it, I could do some map building, you know, and like region building. Uh, using some of my tables in my you know, adventure binder. You guys wouldn't be able to see it, but I'd be able to roll and, and build it using my binder. Uh, building some factions, NPCs, dungeons, if that's interesting to you guys. And I don't know if anyone really wants to watch this. <laughs> I know that as I was running through the Curse of Strahd campaign, it basically just became a session recap. I don't think I'm going to do that for this campaign. Um, I think what I would do would be to, if I did a series on it at all, it would be to occasionally include you guys in my prep. And, and, and really actually mean it this time instead of doing what I did last time, which was kind of half and half and then eventually just become straight recap. So anyway, let me know if this is interesting or if you guys would be interested in that in the future or if you guys would like to hear more of my like design philosophy stuff. I, you know, there's plenty of that out there. But if it is interesting, you know, let me know. All right, guys, I'll see you all in another video.